My name is Alex Dorgen. I'm an Ansible solution specialist, and I'm going to be walking through how I can create an Ansible development server using the laptop installed VS Code along with the remote SSH extension. So how is this different than the code server development environments I've done in the past? So with code server, it actually creates a web application version of VS Code that different users can log into across different ports depending on how I have it set up. I also can then assign passwords to each user, but it wasn't tied to anything other than the passwords that were generated at runtime. So I wanted to look into a different way that could leverage A, not needing multiple ports, and B, leveraging already approved authentication methods for your system, and that's where I came up with using the VS Code Remote SSH extension. So the nice part about this is because it's using SSH to to do that development on that remote server, it uses your existing authentication. So if you've got LDAP users through Active Directory or IDM, or you've got some sort of privileged assets management system that's rotating passwords or keys every so often, I'm leveraging that for my connections so that all continues to work. And because of the fact that this is using SSH, I don't have to set up additional web ports, I don't have to worry about additional firewall rules other than having port 22 open in order to connect to that end system. And because of the fact that this is the laptop version of VS Code, every single version of the Ansible extension works. So Ansible Lightspeed works in this environment as well. Some of the cons are obviously I do have to have VS Code and an SSH client installed on my laptop. So this works across all the different Linux laptops, Macs, as well as Windows laptops, but you do need to make sure those are installed. Obviously I can't control any user settings that they have on their laptops. I can define machine defaults, so I can at least give users an idea of what would be a good default to go with, but I can't define overall every single user's environment. They do have some flexibility in that. I've also gone through the process of adding in a new capability, which I've extended across the other development environments as well, where I can use a shared image storage. Why this is nice, I can have five different users all sharing the same container image or the same execution environment in this case, and they'd get read-only access. So I can have one user maintain all the execution environments for the other users. The other users can use them, get the syntax highlighting and autocomplete and Ansible Navigator capability without having to worry about pulling those environments themselves. So I'll walk through that process today as well. So first I'm going to walk through setting up the shared image storage. So this is not required for the VS Code extension to work, but this does make the process easier and works across all the different code server variants. So I've already set up the survey and playbook and I'll walk through those in a second, but I can have this work across as many servers as I want. In this case, I've already got a VS server stood up and I can set this up to pull a specific execution environment, which will be available to all the different users. I've got my registry username and password in here so I can actually pull from that password protected registry. And this is that shared location that I'm going to set up. Again, I can have this set to be whatever I want, but I have to make sure that each user's config file for storage for the containers has this location built into it. So I'm gonna get this playbook running and then I'll show what this looks like from a playbook standpoint. So going into this, I've got a very simple playbook set up. As you can see, it's got that register user, password, Ansible image, and the additional storage. You've got a lot of variety in terms of where I can pull this from. So it could be from registry.redhat.io, could be from Quay, could be from Private Automation Hub, or any internal registry that you've got set up. And then for the playbook itself, I am creating that shared image directory, making sure Podman exists so I can pull that image. And then there's a specific process where I'm actually pulling this as the root user to that image store location. This is how I'm ensuring that every other user gets read-only access to that image. And then obviously I'm pulling it and then I'm making sure that the correct permissions exist. If I don't update the permissions after I pull that image, users won't actually be able to use that image in any way, shape or form. So either Podman images itself will fail or trying to use the Ansible extension with that execution environment would fail as well. If you notice though, when I ran the job, I did specifically put latest. In the past, I usually set a date time group to ensure I'm using the correct image that I want. The reason why I'm using latest in this case is because I can on the back end rotate through the quote unquote latest image on my own. So the end users can maintain this as their image, but say Saturday at 3 a.m., I can delete the old latest image, pull a new one, and as far as they're concerned, they are operating on the latest image each time and they won't have to update their extension or pull new execution environments or anything like that. So this would streamline the process from that end user standpoint. So this playbook obviously is running. It's going through the process of installing Podman and the longest piece for me will be pulling that execution environment because I do have a fairly large size execution environment, 
But again, this streamlines a lot of what the process will look like in terms of standing this up for the end user. So this does work across all of the other code server variants that I've done. I have updated all of those roles. So if you do want to take advantage of that, if you go into the previous code server roles that existed, that aspect has been added in with that exact variable name. So it does transition across all the different portions. So the other one that exists is, and that will be finished shortly, is actually setting up Ansible and the VS Code remote extension. So I have already installed VS Code on my laptop. It is already up and running, so I'm just going to open Visual Studio Code. The one key aspect that I need is I do need the version. So if you go into about Visual Studio Code, it will tell you the commit. This is specific for actually pulling in the external piece that has to be installed on, in my case, the RHEL 8 server that I'm running this on. I don't need to do this with Ansible. The remote SSH extension will do this as part of what it does when it connects for the first time. Or again, I can use Ansible to do this. I found it easier personally just have Ansible do this so the end user just can connect and be off and running. But this commit version is important because that's what VS Code checks to ensure that it has the correct remote SSH extension. So if I go back, I can actually again launch this job. I've got the limit set up so if I have more than one server and then that survey exists to make sure A, what user I'm setting this up for on that end system, the execution environment that will be set up for Ansible Navigator, as well as the Ansible extension, that shared image storage that we used before. And if you notice that this commit ID is exactly the same as my VS Code commit ID, because that is important. And I'll get this job running as well, and then we'll walk through that playbook. So what does this look like? So again, it's a fairly simple playbook, which looks almost exactly the same as the previous code server ones. The only difference is this commit ID, and obviously I've added in that additional image store. So for the commit ID itself, I do have to make sure A, that directory exists. There's a very specific folder structure that the code server looks for in order to pr provide that SSH connection and the TCP requirements back. And then I do actually basically pull down directly from update.code.visualstudio.com that exact version. So this ensures that you get in the exact version installed into your environment and you are ready to go. No other real changes exist other than, as I talked about with the additional image store, I do have a part after I set up Podman again to ensure that that shared image store is set up for the end user. And all this is doing is providing a storage.conf to that specific user. And all it says is here's an additional image store to look for, that's it. So they can still have their own personal execution environments if they want, it does not limit that, but it does provide the capability of providing consistent execution environments to multiple users without them needing to go kind of through what the process may or may not be. So as you can see, it's actually going through the process of installing all those different pieces, installing the Ansible extension. So again, the end user won't need to set any of this up. If you notice on my VS code, I do already have the Ansible extension installed locally. This won't actually be using this local version. There are some extensions that only work on the remote server. The Ansible extension is one of those and the good benefit of that is it will leverage Podman that's installed on that remote execution node, in this case, RHEL 8. So I don't have to install Podman or Docker on my laptop. I'm actually just using Podman or Docker installed on that RHEL 8 server in my case. So it simplifies this process. So once that finishes up, I'll be able to very conveniently connect to that end server. You can see none of these took that long. It took about three minutes to set up the remote storage and the VS Code extension itself also won't take that long. So once it installs Ansible Navigator, I'll be off and ready to go because I don't have to pull really a new execution environment or anything like that. So again, it simplifies this process as you look into how we can streamline some of this capability. So now that that's done, I'll go back into VS Code and I'm go, going to go into that Remote Explorer. I've got a previous one set up, but I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use that new VS Code. So if I go into the Command Palette and I click Connect to Host, this is just gonna be like a normal SSH connection. So I'm gonna connect as my user to that vs.shadowman.dev. It'll give me the usual, you know, has the fingerprint, no, no names, do I wanna continue, continue. And because I do not have SSH keys set up, it will ask me for my password and it will ask me for my password every time I connect. And this will pull up. Obviously, I don't wanna just connect to my home directory. I do wanna to connect to where my development is occurring. So I can in here, open a, a folder or anything like that. So I'm going to open folder and I want to open my Ansible directory, which conveniently already has playbooks and things like that set up. So I'm going to click OK. It'll open up another window and I can, can put in my password to open up. And I trust it. And as you'll see, this actually now opens up in VS Code, 
with the Ansible extension already installed in the remote server. You can see that I do have some capabilities already pulled in here. So I do have, I talked about the machine specifics, so these are already pulled in here, but I do have my user ones as well. But since the fact that Ansible Navigator is set up, I've got all these pieces, I can actually jump in here and I can open up you know, a local playbook or an example and it will open up and do the syntax highlighting that you expect. So it will give me all that capability of running Ansible Lint because my Ansible extension is set up. And as you can see, Lightspeed does work here because this is a VS Code on a laptop installed version. So it's something to think about if you know you want to use Ansible Lightspeed, this is a way to keep that uh, going properly. And it's leveraging my execution environment that exists. So again, this streamlines many of the existing processes. So obviously, I don't want to have to go through this process of connecting, jumping into this folder every time. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to close this remote connection. I'm going to go back into that remote section and I want to add, I want to add in a new connect command. So I'm just going to do, you know, a dorgen at vs.shadowman.dev, add it into my config file. And because of the fact that I closed it from that particular folder, when I reload, I can actually jump right into that Ansible folder. So I can just click here. It will open up directly back into that folder. So I'm ready to go for my development without doing a whole lot of work. If I happen to close VS Code down at this exact stage, as soon as I open VS Code back up, it will attempt to reconnect via SSH back to this development environment and I'll be off and running. So for me, all of my environment lives behind a VPN. So I'm VPN in this environment, which gives me that SSH capability but I can do my full development on a remote server. Nothing exists on my laptop other than VS Code and an SSH client, which for Mac and many Linux variants already exists. So again, this does simplify quite a bit of the process as you're looking into how can I streamline some of my development environments for the end user while still giving them you know, some of the additional capability. And there you go. I can see that the syntax highlighting works and I'm off and running. So I've updated my Ansible development repository with the additional roles to both add in the shared storage as well as configure the VS Code remote extension. So you can check that out. Also I included documentation for the VS Code remote SSH extension. So if you've got questions about what SSH clients are required on your laptop, all of that's included in there. I will note that you do need to be able to allow remote TCP forwarding. That is a requirement for the remote SSH extension to work properly. So if your environment is locked down and that is prevented, you will not be able to use the remote SSH extension. So just something to keep in mind. Thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit more about the VS Code remote SSH extension. Please let me know if you have any questions. Click my picture on the right to subscribe or click the image on the left to watch another video.